Hello again, it's Lock Noob, and today we're going to do 101 top tips for new lock pickers. I had great fun compiling this with some friends. I hope you enjoy it too. I'd love to hear your comments uh, below. These are in no particular order, so let's get going. We are really lucky as lock pickers. There are loads of great lock pick sets out there. If you don't know what to buy, I always recommend that you go with any of the top major manufacturers out there. They all do a good kit. Find one in your budget if you're looking for a whole set and you won't go too far wrong. A lock pick that works for somebody else, you see them using all the time, they're a great picker. Well, it might not work for you. You will just have to find your own favorite, the one that gives you the feedback uh, that you like and gives you the best position on those pins. Uh, we all are different, we all have our favorites and what works for somebody else, again, it might not work for you. If you're unsure as to what manufacturer makes the right picks for you, and you can afford it, sometimes trying a hook and or a rake from a few that you're interested in is a great way to try some of them out before you commit to buying a whole set. And actually they still can be useful as individual hooks and rakes after you've got a new set anyway, you can always put them in with the other picks. If you can only afford a cheap Chinese lock pick set, don't worry. They might not last as long, they might be a bit thicker, they might not be as good in as many keyways, but they will certainly allow you to pick up the basic skills of lock picking and have a lot of fun. And maybe later you might want to then upgrade to a, a more well-known brand. But again, don't worry, if that's all you can afford, you can still have fantastic fun and a lot of us start that way. Practice, practice, practice. Lock picking is a skill which will diminish over time if you don't practice and you'll only get better by practicing. When you see somebody who's really good at lock picking, very confident at picking a lock they've never come across before with no keys, all those kind of more advanced skills, rest assured they have put the hours and hours of practice in. In some ways lock picking is a bit like learning a musical instrument or any other skill like that where what seems to be almost impossible to begin with becomes easier and easier over time. This is true for a lot of things in life, but comparison is the death of joy and somebody else's success is not your failure. Don't compare your picking skills to other people. You might be better at some lock types than they are and vice versa. They might be more experienced and you're not. The only thing that matters with lock picking is that you are enjoying your hobby. Find that lock which you really enjoy picking and you know you can pick and it's a real joy to pick. We call them comfort locks. It's really, really great to go back to one of those comfort locks when you feel your skills are dipping or you're having a bad day. You just need to, you know, bring back that confidence that, yeah, you can pick a lock. It's just that, you know, it's not working out today. That's perfectly cool. Comfort locks are awesome. I certainly have a couple. If you're getting frustrated with a lock, and for me, it happens a lot, Take a break, come back to it, let your hands rest, let the let everything sort of cool down and just mellow for a bit. Honestly, um, being frustrated and getting that stress level up with a lock, it will not help you pick it. Remember, it's normal for a lock to open like one of the first times you try and pick it and then it doesn't open again like for ages and you just get really frustrated with it. This is completely normal. This happens all the time. Enjoy what you like picking. There are no right locks to pick. There isn't any particular lock that makes you a good lock picker. If you are enjoying your hobby, you are picking the right locks for you. And there are so many lock varieties out there, different types and mechanisms, the same for everybody. Enjoy picking how you like picking. If you want to pick pins up, pick pins up. Pins down, pick pins down. If you'd like to pick things in a vice or in hand, you do what you want to do. It's your hobby, again. We're not locksmiths out in the field picking locks indoors, in the dark, in the rain, upside down with, you know, a customer looking over our shoulder, dogs biting our ankles. So everything we do is by and large a sanitized version of what a real locksmith will be doing. So you pick how you want to do. It's all great. You're, it's, a, it's just a skill. It's just a hobby. It's just some fun. So you do it how you like to do it and don't let anybody else tell you what is a right way to pick a lock. It doesn't matter. The lock picking community is just awesome. I've never met more skilled, generous, awesome people as in the lock picking community. And uh, I would say to you, if you are a lock picker and you haven't been on forums and, and social media and, and met other lock pickers, do reach out. Where you can use a shim, use a core shim. Honestly, when you're disassembling a lock, if you can use one of these little shims, 
please try and use one of those shims. It will save you heartache in the long run, especially when you have a momentary lapse of concentration. You do something silly like forget that the tailpiece has a gap or a notch in it for the circlip, which will trap your driver pins, or you accidentally turn the core a little bit too far. You end up um, snagging your key pins into the pin chambers um, where the driver pins are, and it sort of stops you from removing the lock. And yeah, there's all sorts of reasons why. So use a shim. Don't spend your money on bypass tools and picks for exotic lock types just yet at the beginning of your picking career. They can be super fun, don't get me wrong, but they often don't teach you a lot about different lock mechanisms and, uh, and manipulation of those mechanisms. Albeit fun, probably best waiting. Don't throw away a tool that you don't use. So there might be a pick or a specific tool for a specific lock type that you just go, do you know what, I don't really use this but quite often you might find it be useful later on down the line and you'll really regret um, uh, giving it away or selling it or, or whatever. If you break a pick, then they can be repurposed into either make, using as probes, fashioning into new picks, or even making tension tools out of. And breaking picks is completely normal metal fatigues over time and they do snap, but if it's happening a lot and you're breaking a lot of lock picks, make sure you're going back to your basics, feeling where the pins are and making sure you're picking the pins and not the warding and make sure you're moderating your tension so you're not using so high tension that you end up bending your lock picks. Recognizing when you're oversetting a key pin, that is pushing the key pin past the shear line into where the driver pins would normally sit, um, that is actually quite a hard pin state to feel when you're a new picker and it just takes time and practice uh, to get that feel for what an overset pin feels like in a lock. Uh, it, and it does actually feel different in different locks with different levels of tension used. There is no magic amount of tension that you have to use on a lock. It all depends on your personal preference, your level of skill and the lock itself. You just have to experiment. Some locks like a lot of tension, some need feather light tension, but some people uh, can put on heavy tension on nearly every lock and get opens and some people use super light tension on every lock and get a, get an open. It's all very different. So when somebody says, oh, you have to use X amount of tension or you only use that amount of turning force, um, that isn't always true. Different locks need different amounts of tensions and it also depends on the picker. All locks pick differently even if they are keyed alike, same model, same brand. And that's because of manufacturing differences. It's quite common to have two completely the same brand locks, same model, similar bittings even, and one will be really easy to pick and one will be really, really tricky. So don't think because somebody has picked a lock and you can't pick the same brand that it's always because you lack the skill. It can literally be the differences between the locks themselves. Sometimes we focus on the brand of lock and the types of security pins it might have, but things like the bitting of the key, how extreme that is, how good the tolerances are in the lock and how tight that keyway is, and so many other factors are just as much as a variable to make that lock more or less difficult. And sometimes we forget about that and we focus on the brand, the model, and the types of security pins, but not those other factors. Those plastic see-through locks, they are great, great at learning how a lock works and when you're starting to learn to pick the positions of the pins and in relation to where your pick is and all those other things, but they do not pick the same as a real lock, even a cheap real lock, a low security real lock is much harder to pick, much, much harder to pick than these plastic ones. And whilst I see the value in them, if you really want to learn to pick locks then you have to pick real locks that you would use for locking things up in real life. Charts and lists um, and belt rankings of locks which are more or less easy to pick uses a guide to see how skilled a picker you are. Well, do you know what? They are really, really great fun. I love comparing myself to these lists, but they are only ever a loose guide. As I said before, locks of even the same brand and model due, just due to things like different key bittings can be wildly and 
extremely different to each other to pick in real life. There are such things as easy hard locks and hard easy locks. Super, super cheap, badly made locks can be extremely difficult to pick. Quite often, the manufacturing of those locks is awful and the pins can be um, almost like chewed and gnarled and nasty. They are inconsistent. They catch up inside the lock. A really, really cheap lock, although it could be a bargain and when you're a new picker, it's understandable you want to not spend a lot of money on locks, but sometimes those super cheap locks can be so hard to pick and can actually put you off. For a new picker, I always say experiment with as many techniques and tools as you can, even on the same lock. So if you want to do rocking, raking, zipping, um, even, even using bypasses, whatever it is, it's always good to try to, you know, do as many techniques on any given lock as you can, just because it's a great way to um, up your skills in a range of different techniques. With some locks with two different sides, one's usually on a door, try picking both sides of the lock, especially ones which are used, so you have one side which is more worn than the other, and also try picking it in different orientations, uh, pins up and pins down. You can get a lot out of just one lock and learn a lot more about it. You can gut one side of a Euro cylinder with a segmented follower if you don't have a specific front follower. It is tricky, but it can be done. The notches in some core followers can actually help keep the follower stable so that you can use the notches to guide the pins down into the rear chambers. One top tip is you can start to repin the driver pins in lock from both sides of the lock. It's really useful just because it keeps the follower stable inside the lock and uh, it allows a lot better control of putting those pins back in. Research a lock before picking and gutting it. It really, really helps. Manufacturers have specifications. There are often online blogs and forum posts out there. Maybe there's a YouTube video of somebody else picking that lock and explaining what's happening and taking it apart and, uh, and, and reassembling it again. Quite often with a new lock, there might be things in it that you don't know about, for example, check pins and side pins and all those kind of things, which if you don't do your research, you won't understand why you can't pick a certain lock. Same with gutting. It could be that you end up destroying the lock because you don't realize that there are um, other pin chambers that you've missed or um, other cutaways and all sorts of other things in, going on inside that lock, which you do need to be aware of before you start to disassemble that lock. So do your research before picking. It really helps know what tools you need, what techniques you need, how to gut and how to reassemble. Otherwise, you are actually taking quite a risk in not only picking, but gutting and, and, and maybe even reassembling that lock. Shouldn't need to be said, but don't pick a lock you don't own unless you have the owner's permission. It's most likely that it could be illegal, get you in trouble, and if you damage that lock, then you've damaged somebody else's property. Picking locks can, in fact, damage them, especially locks with uh, delicate trap pins, master wafers, all sorts of things can go on inside a lock. If you pick it, you do risk damaging that lock. Now, experience and care and research can help mitigate those, but if you do start picking a lock, do understand that you do risk, in fact, rarely damaging it. Unless you are collecting locks and you really, really want to collect brand new locks in packets, it's often not economical to buy new locks and secondhand locks or locks that you swapped and traded are often really, really, really good ways to save money when you're first starting the hobby. If you can't afford to buy one, then you can make a cutaway lock with no power tools just by using a hacksaw and a file and a bit of knowledge. And cutaway locks can be of great value to a new picker because they do allow you to see uh, where your pick is positioned, what pins aren't picked yet, maybe which pins are overset. They can be repinned with different security pins, uh, different key pin bittings, all sorts of things. They can add a lot of value to a new picker who maybe doesn't have an awful lot of money to spend on new locks just yet. When taking apart a lock, gutting disasters, are always going to be expected at some point. You will end up destroying a lock. Even if you've taken this apart before and done all the research, quite often a momentary lapse of concentration, maybe you didn't use a shim, your follower slipped, whatever happened, cat jumped on you as you 
uh, we're trying to put it together, you can expect to absolutely destroy a lock at some point, no matter what you do. It happens, don't worry about it. Best thing is to just move on. Raking a lock is often one of those techniques a new picker starts with, and then a lot of pickers move on to single pin picking, picking one pin at a time. Some pickers consider that to be a more skillful approach, but actually, Raking can be as skillful as single pin picking in some cases. And I've certainly seen some people who uh, can do wonderful things with a triple peak rake, which I can barely do with a, a hook pick on its own. So don't think that um, raking isn't a skill. Sometimes we just don't advance our skills with raking over time because we concentrate our skills on single pin picking. And therefore we sometimes only remember raking uh, as we remembered it when we were learning to pick to begin with. Challenge locks are awesome. That's where somebody has taken apart a lock, put in ex more extreme bitting of key pins, changed and modified the barrel of the lock and the pin chambers maybe, put different springs in, modified the actual driver pins, all sorts of tricks. But challenge locks can often be easier to pick than commercially available uh, high security locks with good tolerances, just because by modifying a lock from the manufacturer's original design, you often increase the amount of um, variability inside that lock, decrease the tolerances, and often those that, that sort of cha those changes altogether make a, the lock a little bit easier to pick for an, an ex skilled or experienced picker. And that's worth bearing in mind when you're designing these challenge locks. Are you actually decreasing the uh, security of the lock? Are you actually decreasing the amount of skill uh, it takes to open it? When you have the opportunity, Try and explore the other aspects of lock sport when you can, because, oh my goodness, is there so much out there to explore. You can make picks, you can make tools, you can do key impressioning, key casting. Um, I mean, the possibilities are endless out there. Everything from 3D printing to silver soldering. I mean, it's the amount of skills which you can um, utilize in lock picking as a hobby it's just phenomenal and it's one of those things which really 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 make this a superb hobby to start and when you can really just try and uh, see what else you can do around this hobby it, it just makes it so awesome all lock types offer their own set of skills to learn so if you've been picking to standard pin tumbler locks for some time and you think oh I wonder if there's anything else to, to pick out there well, you don't have to just go higher and higher security locks and more exotic locks. You can just go different lock types. There are disc detainer locks, wafer locks. There are um, leave locks, curtain lever locks. There's all sorts of different lock types out there, all offering their own sets of skills to learn. Uh, you know, there are automotive locks, safe locks, combination locks, everything you can think of out there. And all of them take um, uh, a set of skills which you can spend a lifetime honing. So yeah, this is one of those hobbies that you can really never fully master everything, it's great. New locks pick far differently to old, well-used, possibly dirty locks. So especially if they've not been cleaned, um, picking a brand new lock of the same brand and model as one that's been used in a door for 10 years every single day, they pick far differently. So it's always good to try to just pick a range of locks of different ages as well. They all offer their unique challenges. Never think that a lock is impossible to pick. It just might not be possible yet. The only lock you're guaranteed not to pick is the one you never try. We all have a naughty bucket. We all have a load of locks which we just can't get ahead around just yet. But don't ever throw them away or exchange them because the sense of pride when you finally get that level of skill and you get one of those locks open is awesome. When you get new lock picks from a manufacturer, sometimes the edges can be a little bit uh, rough maybe, and that can catch on the warding inside of the keyway. A little light sanding might actually be needed, but remember, a mirror polish isn't, although it does look great. Like most hobbies, having great equipment and all the equipment, it doesn't equate to skill. You don't need everything to become a great lock picker. A good set of picks, load of tension tools, and some nice locks is all you really need. Don't use Oil lubricant in a lock that is lubricated with graphite. It's hard to know sometimes, especially in padlocks where you can't disassemble them, what it's been lubricated with. But if you mix oil and graphite together, it creates a really sticky, horrible paste and it just gunks up your lock. 
when buying used locks, try to get one with a key to make sure it's in working order. Quite often, um, you have no choice. You get a big batch of locks. Some don't have keys and most of them will work. But I always say try to get locks with keys um, just because it just makes a, a better thing. You can test it opens. It's easy to gut when you've got a key, all those kind of things. So yeah, I always recommend buying a used lock with a key. Shrink tubing is your friend, especially for those lock picks with bare metal handles. It just makes them a little bit more comfortable. It's really cheap, easy to apply, and uh, it's just awesome to have a, a load around if you're a lock picker. And wiper blade inserts are also your friend. Get them off mates when they're changing their windscreen wipers. Same if you're changing your own windscreen wipers on your car or truck. Um, the flexible inserts, which keep the wiper blade itself flat against your window, uh, are springy, made of stainless steel quite often. They are great for making tension tools from. You can never have enough locks. You really can never have enough locks if you're a lock picker. It's great collecting locks. You never have enough. It's always good to go back to locks you picked um, and just you know, keep honing those skills. It's always good to have new locks as a challenge out there for you to pick. You can just never have enough locks. Watch a lot of lock picking videos. It's always good to see how other people approach a lock. It might be so much you go, oh, I didn't know you could do it like that. Or, oh, that's how they did it. Or maybe, oh, they're using that pick. Mm, that would be really good for my lock, which has a similar bitting. When you're first learning to lock pick, watching a range of pickers can be really helpful to you know, learn a load of different approaches to picking locks and the load, and just watch um, how different lock pickers approach a lock. Your style will be your own style, but sometimes it can help emulating other people's styles and techniques to begin with, just to learn what works for you. So super thin picks, ones under 18 thousandths of an inch in, in thickness are often hardly ever needed. Uh, there are locks where you do need super thin picks, maybe down to even 10 thousandths of an inch. Uh, and when you do need them, you really do need them. But for the most part, any lock pick around 25 thousandths to 18 thousandths thick, that'll get you through most of your locks most of the time. Thicker, stiffer picks just give better feedback. So when learning to pick a lock, if you can maneuver a thicker pick in the keyway and it's not rubbing against the warding, allows you good access to the pins, usually the thicker the pick, the better. <laughs> you will use 20% of all of your pick tools, 80% of the time, there will be a handful, maybe four or five picks and rakes that you will use all the time. And there'll be all the rest of your tools you'll use some of the time. Uh, it doesn't mean that they are a waste, but it's honestly, just have a look at the picks you use the most. You will find you only use a handful of them. Expensive locks, self-rated as high security by the manufacturer, do not always equate to being locks which are hard to pick. They might have other qualities against anti-bump, physical attacks, all those other things, but they might not mean that they are a hard lock to pick. You won't be good at picking every day, so don't be hard on yourself. Some days, they just won't work out for you. Maybe you've got other stresses in life. Maybe you're just thinking about other things. Maybe you're excited about the holiday you're going to go on the next day. Just remember, you won't be good every single day. Don't be hard on yourself. Recording yourself picking can really help you learn and maybe help other people if you put it on YouTube. Record yourself picking, play it back, see what you were doing. Maybe you pick up on something you did which when you were in the middle of picking, um, you didn't notice. Maybe you'll hear sounds on the recording which you didn't pick up before and you can concentrate on next time. It's a really good way to learn. And again, if you put it up on YouTube, maybe something which other people can learn off. A cheap vice, a little suction vice for a few dollars can go a super long way. And it's one of those pieces of equipment that I recommend any new picker to get as soon as they can. They hold um, many, many different lock types. They're really cheap. And it's a great, great way to keep a lock stable when when you're picking. It's honestly something you probably should buy straight away when you're learning to lock pick. The first set of picks you buy is most likely to be the, the, the wrong set of picks for you. Um, I mean, I know some lock pickers who got lucky on their first lock pick set, but you've, you can do as much research as you want. And quite often you tend to just buy um, what you think is the best lock pick set at the time. And a few years on, you'll have either made up your own kit or you'll realize actually you prefer another manufacturer after all, and you tend to buy their picks. Don't worry about it. We all make mistakes, but never throw away your old kit. Don't read too much into YouTube lock picking. What you see is nearly always real people picking real locks in you know in real time 
on camera and it can look very impressive. But what you don't see is the, maybe the years of practice running up to that. It didn't show the practice put into that particular lock before filming started. It didn't show the failures and the re-records. Just bear that in mind that YouTube is a fantastic, great resource, but it is also a small distortion of reality and don't use it to gauge your own picking skill. Just don't. It's fantastic. I love YouTube. But don't put yourself off lock picking by thinking other people are better than you just because you've seen it on YouTube. Hardly any lock is picked first time by a lock picker approaching that lock for the first time. It just isn't. You know, it might be that you got the tension wrong, you need a different pick or whatever. So if you get the impression that some people just pick up a lock and pick it, that can be true for some locks some of the time, but hardly any lock is picked first time. One cool thing to do is just try keeping your keys separate to your locks on a, on a different keychain or something like that. Why? Well, knowing what the bitting of a lock is can really help you determine what tool to use and it can help you uh, maybe read which pins to only lift a little bit and which ones you lift a lot to pick the lock. If you don't have the key and you keep them separate, after a while you'll forget what the bitting is like for a particular lock and that means that every time you approach that lock it'll be... Um, and I'm air quoting here, a bit more realistic um, and a bit more of a challenge. It's a really good way to learn to, to pick locks is to just keep the keys separate, but keep the keys. One really fun thing to try is revisiting your collection. Even if you picked a load of locks, just grab a whole load of locks at random, just sit down, maybe um, have some quiet music on in the background, get yourself a drink and just just go and have a nice quiet picking session. It can be really stress relieving and a lot of fun, especially locks which you know you can pick and you know they're a, a moderate challenge, but you know you can get there. Just really nice confidence boosting. Um, just having a, you know, even if it lasts a few hours of lock picking, it can be super, super good fun. Swapping and exchanging locks with people in the community is a great way to save more money and experience a wider range of locks, um, maybe even from different countries than you're able to, to get normally. Outside of YouTube, there are loads of free tutorials, blogs and forum posts out there um, available online for you to, to delve into as a lot picker. There are so many things out there um, you know, for you to access these days online about locks, even going to the manufacturers themselves and looking at their lock specifications and the, the pictures, looking at patents, all those kind of things. Superb resources online these days. So don't just sit at, on YouTube, get out there, explore the net and see what else there is out there about locks. There's so much out there, so many great blog posts and, um, and articles, it's great. And there are loads of free 3D printing resources available as well. Even if you use a 3D printing service or you have a 3D printer at home, you can print so many tools uh, for lock picking, followers, uh, 3D printing disc detainer picks, pinning trays, uh, so many things out there just to um, help you with your lock sporting hobby. It's really worth exploring what's out there that you can get 3D printed or 3D print yourself. Avoid locksmith specific tools, especially ones with like single lock types. They can be really cool and I would never say to somebody if you can afford it and you're at the right place in your lock sport hobby that you think is a worthwhile purchase. But for the most part, locksmith specific tools, um, you're not going to get a lot of usage out of as a, a lock sporter. Uh, so until you're at that place in the hobby where it makes sense to do so, just try to uh, avoid buying those locksmith specific tools for now. Tool rolls and pencil cases make great cheap pick cases. As you get more and more equipment, um, sometimes you just need somewhere to store some stuff, especially if you've made your own picks and tools. And tool rolls and pencil cases on eBay um, or other, other places can just make really good storage solutions. Progressive pinning is a great way of learning a new and hard lock. If you've been struggling with a lock and it's got say six pins and you just can't pick it, maybe if you're confident in doing so, remove all the pins and springs from the back three chambers. So you're just left with one, two, and three pinned up. That means that you can learn to pick a three pin lock, then maybe populate the chambers in position four, then five, and then finally six. Build up that skill, build up the knowledge of the lock, uh, and it can be a great way of learning. Get a cheap lock disassembly kit sooner rather than later. For the most part, that'll just be some followers and some tweezers, but could have other pieces of equipment as well. Learning to disassemble and reassemble locks is a huge part of the lock sport hobby. And again, if you want to do things like progressive pinning, disassembling locks is the way that you do that. 
if picking a lock is just not working out for you on a particular day, slow down, calm down, take a breath, maybe even take a rest, but go back to really feeling those pin states. Quite often we rush a lock, we rely on our innate skill that we've built up over the years, but it sometimes helps to just go, am I really concentrating on the pin states? Am I feeling for when a pin is set, underset, overset? Am I really feeling that small amount of counter rotation that um, shallow spools and serrated pins might offer? Am I really thinking about whether there are bevel pins in there? Sometimes going back to basics and really concentrating on the lock and taking it slowly can really help. Remember, lock picking isn't just about what you feel with the pick on the pins. It can be also about how it sounds and sometimes how the lock feels if you're holding onto it. Use all of your senses. Because of the distance between the tip of the hook to the shank, short hooks often give better feedback and more intuitive positioning. That is to say, where in your mind's eye you feel the tip of the pick is inside a lock than a deeper hook does. So a more a, the deeper the hook, quite often the harder it is to, in your mind's eye, imagine where you are in the lock and get a feel on the pins. Uh, so that's why quite often we use a short hook first and then move upwards in terms of uh, the hook depth in a lock when learning to pick it. You can get a lot of feedback from holding onto a padlock uh, when picking it in hand because you can feel pin setting and maybe sometimes the core rotation uh, with your offhand when picking the lock. Sometimes you can't pick a lock because you just don't have the specific tool and, and that is sometimes sad but true. Sometimes you just can't approach picking a lock unless you've either bought or built, designed, created the tool for picking that lock. Making your own tools for a specific lock can help you learn a lot about the lock itself and can be incredibly satisfying to do. We all buy stuff because it's cool, even if it's not practical. There's nothing wrong with it if you can afford it, um, uh, so there's no shame. Making up your own pick set from multiple manufacturers is often the best way to get a kit that works for you. Using a pinning mat can help reduce the risk of you losing pins and springs to the floor when um, assembling and, and reassembling a lock. It can really, really help. If you remove the retaining clip or mechanism from the back of a lock so that it's easier to gut, especially if you're picking on camera, that can be super risky because when you're withdrawing your tools once the lock is picked, you can often risk pulling the whole uh, core out of the lock body, uh, spilling all the guts everywhere and sometimes actually destroying the lock. When buying lock picking equipment, shop around, look at multiple reviews, ask your friends, ask people in the community what they think. You can never always, unless you actually try it yourself, find out what will work for you. But I always say, do your research before buying something. Not every lock bargain is. You might see a lock on sale on a retailer and think, wow, that's going to be a super bargain. But quite often, it isn't. Even if you see a bargain, shop around, look on secondhand sites, look on different retailers. Quite often, people inflate prices um, on second-hand sites when they don't really know the real value of a lock. Um, they just know they actually spent a lot of money on it and want to uh, recoup some of that money back. Quite often, if you just wait a bit longer, you can get that lock for a lot, lot cheaper. Non-standard tensioners like feather tensioners and tensioner rings, they often work best with um, lock pick guns and electro picks. They don't really work out for when you're picking a lock by hand. Uh, manually, most of the time, a solid non-twisted tension tool is the best because it conveys the best feedback. You can never have enough tension tools. And quite often you need more tension tools than you need lock picks because getting a nice tight fit um, in the lock in the right position, which doesn't bind the core when, it's, when you're putting it under tension, um, that is so super important to get that right before you start picking a lock. If you can physically meet up with real lock pickers, um, even if it's just down the pub or in a conference or anything like that, just to talk and to learn from them, to chat and to trade with them, it's an awesome experience and I would definitely recommend you do that at some point. Ideally, when looking at buying lock picks, if you can get the Euro Slim or Slimline versions of a lock pick from a manufacturer, they are often better because they will navigate more keyways than uh, picks with uh, higher shank heights. 
Don't forget with some locks, you can literally pick through the warding with a deep enough hook. You don't have to pick around the warding. There is no right profile of a pick for a particular lock in 99% of the cases. If it works for you, it works for you. Tensioning a lock, top of the keyway, or pin side or bottom of the keyway away from the pins is mostly a preference, but both can give more access to a lock's pins depending on the keyway. Lock picking makes you a more considerate and sensitive lover. Being tired and stressed or otherwise chemically impaired is not conducive to lock picking. When interacting online or in person, encourage other lock pickers. Remember, we all started somewhere. A lock you might find easy, another skill picker may find hard and vice versa. I still have locks which some of my friends find really easy to pick and I struggle to pick those locks. Whilst there are other locks which I have which I find super easy which some of my friends find really hard. Look after your hands. Don't forget to rest them. Um, getting blisters and cramp, especially when you're getting frustrated using too much tension, it's a real thing. Don't forget to rest, look after yourself. Using an insert or shim at the front of the keyway can actually protect from damaging the lock itself. Don't forget, you can change tension position halfway through picking a lock at any point. It just takes a little bit of care. It's nothing wrong with swapping picks halfway through picking either. If that pick isn't working out, keep that tension on, swap picks away, even swap from raking to picking and picking to raking. Not all disattained locks can be picked using front tension. Some only tension from the rear or from the center, and that can require specialist tools. Just due to picking the lock or putting too much tension on it or, or something else, you will eventually destroy or permanently damage a lock. You will never run out of picking challenges. The journey is never over. I've not met any picker ever who claims to be an expert in every different lock type and mechanism for every brand. Um, you might not want to explore all different lock types, but certainly you'll never run out and never become a, a super expert in everything. This is one of these hobbies which will go on for a lifetime and you'll still feel that you have a lot to learn. When starting out though, just try concentrating on one lock type at a time. So for example, standard pin tumblers or dimple locks or whatever. It really helps just to concentrate on one lock type at a time when you're first starting out so you can build up the skills and knowledge of lock picking and then branch out. You don't have to try everything at once, otherwise it can become quite overwhelming. And my final and top tip is subscribe to this channel if you haven't subscribed already, it really helps me out. Share the video if you liked it and think other people will benefit from it. If you have tips that I haven't covered and you think that I missed, add them below. Make this a resource that other people can uh, read and comment on underneath the, the extra tips below. Um, I really like encouraging new lock pickers and, and, and trying to get the wisdom of the community out there uh, so that everybody can sort of learn from each other. So yeah, do add some comments. I read them all. I reply to as many as I can. If you like this video, please leave a like. That would be awesome of you. And of course, I'll see you all next time.